Hey, you have come to the right place for encouragement today. So go ahead and click the subscribe button so that you can be connected to all the videos that we upload all throughout the week. Now, you may feel led to get connected to the ministry as you're watching this video, and we've made that super simple for you. Go ahead and check out our description to find out the ways that you can connect with us. Now, while you're watching, you may also feel led to sow into the ministry, and we encourage that because we know that our ministry can reach those that are far, near, and in our backyard. We have outreaches all throughout the year, and you will help us tremendously by sowing into our ministry. Thanks for watching. Now check out this message. When you've been living for a while, and I don't know how many feel like me, but when you've been living for a while, whenever you hear about something that sounds really good, your first instinct is to say, it's too good to be true. You know, when you meet that right guy and everything seems perfect, you're like, mm, you know, it's a little too good to be true or or, or vice versa, or you walk into the job and, and they're giving you all these great promises and you're saying to yourself, it's too good to be true. And the way I say it is, what's the catch? What's the catch? What's the real fast speaking at the end of the commercial? What's the catch? It could make me feel better, but it could lead to bleeding and it could lead to disorientation and, and seizures and heart attacks and stroke. So what's, what's, what's the catch? Because it sounds good, but you know, when you lived a little bit, life has a way of making you say that things are too good to be true. Whether it's things you've really gotten your hopes up in and said, oh, this is going to be God and you were let down or you know, people that have overpromised and underdelivered, and you have so many people that promise you things that never come through that the minute somebody even makes a promise to you, you don't even like them no more. <laughs> I've been doing this so long that I'll just let you know when somebody says, I'm going to be here forever, I don't like you no more. <laughs> because my experience is the ones that say it are always the quickest to leave. And it's those quiet ones that kind of look like they're not going to make it. They tend to be here 10 years later, 15 years later, <coughs> Colleen, <laughs> Ursula and them. You know, it's the ones that you kind of thought were going to fall off because they never said nothing, but they kept falling their way to growth. Th those are the ones that you tend to put, put stock in. But life puts you in a place where you get let down so much that being let down becomes more normal to you than your expectations being met. It's what's the catch? What's the catch? And life has a way when you get into this place of making you say that. But the danger of having that mentality is this. If you don't control it, you can easily start to feel that way about the promises of God. Especially in waiting seasons where you've been digging and you've been praying and you've been trying to do everything right and there's something about the weight, hope deferred, the Bible says, makes the heart sick. There, there's something about waiting that can crush your spirits. Waiting on the letter to come from the college, you know, waiting on the right man or woman, waiting on your spouse to get saved, waiting on the opportunity, waiting for the finances to come in. It has a way of making your heart sick when you know that God has promised you something. I wonder today how many people are in here getting sick because you feel like God has let you down. You feel like God has not come through or that all of these promises that you hear do not apply to you. And truthfully, if you can be honest, you feel like that hamster that's on the spinning wheel and this is your Monday and this is your Tuesday, and this is your Wednesday. This is getting up for work. 
This is going home to the kids. This is trying to make service. This is trying to figure out which bills get paid this week and which ones you'll faith till next week. This is putting off BGE till they give you the final notice. This is letting your cable get turned off and then having to figure out how to get it turned back on. This is T-Mobile cutting off your phone on a Sunday morning. And you're trying to work out a payment plan to pay them back. This is what life can feel like. This is what arguments in your marriage can feel like. This is what correcting your kids and going to the school can feel like. I wonder how many people, when you look at your life, this is the illustration. And you're truthfully just getting worn out. It's, it's a different, there's a difference between being tired physically and being tired mentally. And there are people here that don't need a nap. You need a blessing. Because the only way you're going to snap out of being this tired is if God shows up and shows you that he has a plan for your life. Say, what's the catch? In our text today, we have a young guy who, if he could be honest with us today, wakes up every day feeling like he himself is on that hamster's wheel. His name is Elijah. His, his name means salvation. His name is Elijah. And he has the responsibility of holding down the family business. His family had a farm. His mother and his father are elderly. And every day he got up to work with his oxen. Like I said, this is the family business. He, he has to do this. If he does not do this, his family does not eat. If he does not run the family business, the family does not survive. His mother and his father are depending on him for their survival. I wonder today how many have people that are depending on you for your survival or for, for their survival. But like I said, I know he's miserable because the average person would read over this text and say, oh, he's working the oxen and he is on the 12th oxen. He, he's just working, but when you have a sense of purpose, you can read the text and know that he is miserable. Because anytime you feel like you are born or were born for more, mediocre is worse than death. There's an aching in your soul when you know that God has more for your life. There's an aching in your soul when you know that God has more for your marriage. There's an aching in your soul when you know that God has more for your children. There's an aching in your soul when you know that you would be an amazing husband, an amazing wife. But nobody's knocking on the door. There's an aching in your soul when you know you could get a business off the ground. If only one person or one bank would believe in you. When I see the text, I see a young boy who probably hates his life. And I have a feeling there are some people here and some people watching. If you could just be honest between me and you. Life did not go the way you planned. If you could be honest just between me and you. The 18-year-old you would be disgusted at the 45-year-old you. If we could just be honest, life did not pan out the way you thought it would. This 
is where Elisha is. He is working the oxen. But little does he know that while he's working on the oxen and while he's working on his parents' field, there are conversations that are happening about him on a whole nother level. See, what we don't get is while we're waiting, God expects for working to take place. The Bible says that he gave some apostles and he gave some prophets and he gave some evangelists and he gave some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, yes. But for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, God calls people. And we are all called to be one of those five. That's why the Bible, the, the, I believe it was the writer of Hebrews that says, at the time that you should all be teachers, you have need that one teach you. All of us fall into that category at some point. You may not be an apostle. You may not be a prophet. You may not be an evangelist, a pastor, or, you know, or, or a pastor. But at the end of the day, we are all called to be teachers of the word. So if God calls us, what does he call us to do? He calls us to perfect his people. He calls us to edify the body of Christ. And he calls us for the work of the ministry. Say the work. The work. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in what? The work of the Lord. See, God never calls lazy people. He looks for working people. And I, I, to be a worker is a mentality. I've been working since arguably I was about eight years old. I, I, I never had a summer off. When I was eight years old, my dad would take me on construction sites and I was taking everybody on the site water because they didn't have a babysitter. He would take me in the summer to give everybody on the construction site water. And as I got older, I would do that on the summer and I would work tampers. Tampering at 10 and 11 years old, tampering asphalt driveways. Then he became a bricklayer and in the summer I would go out to brick sites and I would make mud as a teenager. I worked at a car wash at 13 years old. When my mom had a cleaning job, my mom worked three jobs when I was growing up. I would help her every morning clean a doctor's office. And when she was bed stricken with my sister getting ready to give birth, she was out for two months. I rode my bike all by myself miles up the road. And as a young little teenager, I was letting myself into this doctor's office turning off the alarm code and spending hours cleaning and mopping this doctor's office, vacuuming the floors, changing the trash bags. My mom's on vacation with my family right now, but mom, give me a wave in the chat room if I'm telling the truth. <laughs> but she taught me a good work ethic. I've always worked. I don't know what it's like to not work. It's a mentality. So when I got into ministry, guess what I started doing at 19? How can I work? I started driving the church van around. I never let the pastor get to church before me. I was always there and I never left the building till he left. I just always assumed something needed to be done. And when I was ordained, I remember Pastor Sharp, I'd stay after vacuuming. He'd say, Minister Tig, we don't like ministers to vacuum. We have people that do that. And I just said, well, it's all I know. Because I cleaned for my mom. So when I came to church, I cleaned the church and I didn't stop cleaning our church till Modesty and Jalen's family came and, and they said, pastor, we got this. And from that point forward, I haven't had to clean the church. I just do some electric in the church because I'm a, a, a licensed electrician. But all I've ever known is works. So when I got saved, I just started working. 
I can always tell somebody's work ethic by how they show up. And how you show up shows me what the next five years of your life is going to be like based upon whether or not God is going to meet you. So it doesn't surprise me that a conversation is happening on the other side of Israel about Elijah while he's working a dead-end job, not thinking about tomorrow, thinking about right now, because as a young farmer, there is no tomorrow. This is my life. This is my parents' expectations of me. And I want to share with you before I really get started that, and some are ready for this, but if God is going to bless you and God is going to call you and God is going to use you, are you prepared to fail somebody else's expectations of you? Because before this text is all said and done, Elisha is going to fail mom and dad. Mom and dad that need them. Mom and dad that won't survive without them. He is going to kiss them on the cheek. And tell them to figure out their future. Because God is calling me. For all of those that feel like I got to give my money here and I got to give my money there. And I, I don't have it in my budget to give it to God. God says, stay with the oxen. Because until you get so serious. Jesus said, no man that loves mother or father more than me is fit for me. Before the story is all said and done, he is going to let down his mother and father. And I have a feeling that there are people here that miss out on opportunities, not because you're not called, but because you rather give people your heart than God your heart. And every time you say yes to God, you are letting down somebody else. So, on the other side of the city, on the other side of the nation, this boy that's been working, God is talking about him. Now, let me fill in some details real quick. The, the main prophet of that day was a guy named Elijah. He was bad. People feared this guy. He was so bad that he went on to a mountain and called 850 prophets together or so. And all by himself confronted them, 850 to one odds, went against him. Because with God, it does not matter what the odds are. With God, it doesn't matter how back against the wall you are. With God, it doesn't matter if they're 850 to 1 odds or a million to 1 odds. If God has your back, you always defy the odds. You cannot lose with God on your side. God doesn't know what losing feels like. The grave could not keep him. The, the grave clothes could not stay on him. God does not know what losing is like. That that's why when a David hooked up with God, Goliath had to fall. That's why when a Moses hooked up with God, Pharaoh had to crumble. That's why whenever God has connected with somebody, walls like Jericho had to come falling down. Because if God is with you, you can defy all the odds. What is cancer? What is sickness? What is loneliness? What is disease? I don't care what the odds are against you. If God is with you, you will always defy the odds. Say, I got God with me. So I can overcome what I'm going through. I can overcome what I'm feeling. I can overcome what's attacking me. Say, I got God with me. He was bad. He defied the odds because he had God with him. And the nation trembled. He was so powerful. That in the midst of famine, he was able to birth rain. The Bible says he got on a stool in the birthing position and started pushing, pushing. And the harder he pushed, the bigger the rain cloud got. Bad. 
But sadly, that particular story would be the beginning of his unraveling, in a way. The beginning of the end of his journey. Because what leaders don't tell you is that every great success takes something out of you. Remember when Jesus fed the 20,000 people, 5,000 men, not including women and children, and he began to give the sermon about what the flesh and the bread represented, and the bread and the flesh represented him. Him. He was the bread that came down from heaven. Him. His flesh would be ripped apart before he got to the cross. It was all him. And the 20,000 people, the Bible says, went home full of Jesus. They went home full. Jesus went home empty. And Jesus had to go up on the mountain to pray. And the disciples would get stuck in a storm. But Jesus had to go up to the mountain to pray. Because you cannot be greatly used by God and not go before God to get refreshed. Elijah did not go back before God. He went into a cave. It says after his greatest moment of his ministry, Jezebel said, this time today, you will die by tomorrow. And he hid. And this one woman's threat unraveled him. Now some would say, how does a little woman have that much power? Every brother in here will tell you. <laughs> Don't, don't sleep on her. <laughs> and he got so bad that he said, Lord, I don't want to live no more. Because great moments with God tend to put you in deep depressions. He said, I don't want to live no more. And God tried to encourage him. He gave him still small voices after putting on a show of wind and fire for him. And he couldn't shake it. And God said, okay. And here's how you know you're in a bad place. He said, there's, there's, there's nobody left serving the Lord. And God would say, I got 7,000 people that have not bowed. But you know you're in a bad place with God when you start to think that you're the only one serving God right. I know a lot of churches that are like that. We're the only holy church left. And you're really in a really bad place. Because the thing about God is God will never leave the earth without a voice. There will always be a remnant of people that are not doing it the world's way. But in the midst of his depression and tapping out, God said, I cannot let the show end with you. He says in 1 Kings... 19, that I have prepared, I have prepared Elisha, Elisha, I've prepared him for you. He, he tells him to go down, a, a little bit before this, he tells him to go down and, and anoint the next king of Israel. And he says, also, I have prepared Elisha, the son of Jehu, to be prophet in your place. Now, I'm a Bible person that likes to put stuff together. And Elijah means salvation. Jehu, his father, his name means judgment. And actually, this is a shadow of Jesus coming because the judgment of the law would be the very thing to conceive salvation. You do not appreciate salvation unless you have something pointing you to the need of it. But look at this. While he's working a dead-end job, while he's hating getting out of bed every day, while he's not looking for a better tomorrow, God is talking about him. I want to tell somebody today 
The reason you can't quit right now is because God is talking about you. I know you hate your life, and I know sometimes you hate getting out of bed, and I know you feel like everybody is pulling from you, but if you could only hear what God is saying on another level about you, you would be shocked at what God is saying. And God is not just putting him in the category of church people. His name is coming up with kings. Do you not realize where God is about to take you? Do you not realize what God is planning for your future? You're wrestling with the oxen and God is talking about you with kings. Who would have thought? thought that God knew his name, that God knew his father's name. But here's the thing. The Bible says God goes to and fro looking for one person he can show himself strong through. You don't need a co-signer. All you need is God. God is looking for a worker. God is looking for a server. It is God that sees you getting up early. It is God that sees you in the hot Judean sun. It is God God that sees you trying to take care of your family. It is God that sees you whipping those oxen. It is God that sees you digging that dirt. God was looking for a digger. Where are the diggers in the room? All God was looking for was a digger. He wasn't looking for a church goer. Elijah had a whole school of prophets. And God didn't want the schooled. God didn't want the educated. And there were 7,000 that did not bow. God didn't want them either. He wanted a boy that didn't know church. He wanted a boy that knew work. When God got me, he did not get a boy that knew church. He got a boy that knew work. And that same mentality would have me building a church. That same mentality would have me digging in my word. Because God didn't get a church boy. God got a digging boy. Yeah. He was looking for a digger. Because the thing about a digger is a digger understands dirt. And see, the prophet has so much to offer, so much life experience to offer. See, whenever a person says, I want your spirit, they got to, in a way, have your struggle. Because everything I do for God, all you see is the small tip of the iceberg sticking out of the water on a Sunday. My life struggle is so big under the water. And so when you pray for the tip, you got to be careful because you cannot get the tip without getting my struggle. So people get close and say, I prayed for your spirit. Why is my life falling apart? It's because God is catching up your struggle for the tip. So God needed somebody that had his struggle. And he knew that when I found him digging dirt, he was the one. Because he has good ground for the seed I'm going to put in him. Do you have good ground for the seed that God wants to put in you? He had good ground. So Elijah starts walking. And he is looking for Elisha, but Elisha is not looking for him. Elisha is focused on the field, is focused on the dirt, is focused on the oxen. Elisha is on a mission looking for him. This shows me you don't have to look for what God has for you. What God has for you will look for you. You don't need to know its name. You don't need to know where it's coming from. But this is why you get out of bed every day. 
This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice in it. Give me this day my daily bread. I get out of bed every day because I don't know. Maybe it's this Monday or maybe it's five Mondays from now. But one of these days, God is going to send a blessing looking for me. A blessing with my name. A blessing that knows my location. A blessing tied to my purpose. He did not know that the blessing was coming. But the blessing was on the way to every person that's struggling, to every person that wants to give up. Don't give up now. There is a blessing on the way. God spoke it and it is coming to find you. Say, don't give up now. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your child. Don't give up on your family. Don't give up on life. Don't give up on your career or your education because there is something that is on the way. There is something that is going to change your whole normal, your whole life. You're going to start waking up and having a whole different outlook on your future. If you can just keep digging, the blessing is coming. Say Elijah's on the way. He has no idea the blessing is coming. He is focused on the field, but the man of God is going to be focused on him. He did not come to church looking for an opportunity. He was staring at the work. And that's why God wanted him, because all the kids in the school of the prophet were looking for an opportunity. He wanted somebody that was raw and understood work. And it says in 1 Kings 19 that he would just depart. And he found Elijah, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with the 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he with the 12th. Look at how beautiful God's writing is. Elijah was God's spokesman for the nation of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel. And he finds a guy that's working with 12 yoke of oxen. Who would have thought that before this moment, Everything about his life was tied to his destiny. I guarantee you he never looked at the 12 oxen and said, one day I'm going to be God's voice for the 12 tribes of Israel. But when Elijah found him, it all made sense. And I want to say this, right? But I found this with oxen. It says that that oxen, let me find it. It says oxen respond to voice commands and negative reinforcement such as the crack of the whip on their rumps based on their prey animal instincts. For example, you could say, come here to get them to move forward. Oxen only respond to two things, commands and correction. And isn't that like God's people? We're supposed to respond to his commands. But when we stop responding to commands, he has to use negative reinforcement. But the negative reinforcement is never to punish us. It's to get us back to the place where we start responding to his voice again. So, so as, I, as I jump quickly into the text that I want to get to, I, I want to talk about the, the lessons from the oxen. Give me some oxen in the chat room. The, the lessons from the oxen. Look at what the oxen taught him. The oxen taught him commitment. He had to get up early every day. He had to feed them, water them, wash them down. They taught the young man commitment. Because one day he's going to have to be committed to the things of God, because everything about his future will not be great. But his commitment to the oxen had positioned him to not just serve God in good times, but bad times also. The oxen taught him commitment. The oxen taught him consistency. He had to get up early every day. Farmers will tell you they do not get up at noon 
to go outside, they get up before the sun comes out. They've eaten breakfast by 3.30 a.m. They're done work by noon because they're trying to beat the sun. And I've been to Israel multiple times. And in this time of the year, it's over 100 degrees. It's consistency. Farming is consistency. Working with animals is consistency. And for where God's taking him, he will need consistency in his life. He cannot be up and down. He has to be steadfast. He has to be unmovable. He has to be always abounding. Paul would tell Timothy, in season and out of season. The oxen taught him culture because when you're chopping up the ground and digging the ground with the oxen, you are cultivating the ground. The oxen taught him the importance of culture. Command, because that's how you have to speak to the oxen. They respond to your commands. And they taught him correction, because when they're not responding to the commands, they have to be corrected. All of these things would come full circle. Because when he starts following Elijah, it is going to take great commitment. Because we will see he will reject him multiple times. It will take great consistency following the man of God. Because Elijah liked his guys to get up super early before him. The oxen taught him that. He understands the power of culture through cultivating. So when he starts following the man of God, he will not change the man of God's culture, but he will adapt to the culture that's been set. He will be able to take commands that don't make sense because he has commanded the oxen to do things that did not make sense. And he will respond to correction because he realizes that when I miss the command, who the Lord loves, he, the only person the Bible says in Hebrew that does not get corrected by God is a bastard. That's in the King James Version. All of these will be necessary because following and being mentored by Elijah will be challenging. And everything that God has you going through now and throughout your past has been preparing you not just for your biggest blessing, but in some ways your most challenging season. And we'll see in first, second Kings 2 that if it had not been for the oxen, he probably would have failed on the cusp of his blessing. See, at this point, and I'm just fast forwarding a little bit, he has been following Elijah for six years and, and it's getting to the finish line where he's about to be taken up. And it was six years of, of, of serving, six years of washing his hands, washing his clothes, washing his tents, building his tents. And as he gets ready to be taken up, it says in 2 Kings 2, 1, he says, I got to go to Gilgal. Stay here. And he says, as the Lord lives and thy soul lives, I will not leave you. And they go to Gilgal. Then they go to Bethel and he says the same thing. Stay here as the Lord lives and my soul, thy soul is. I will not leave you. And, and, and he goes with them. And, and then they go to Jericho and he says, stay in Jericho as the Lord lives and thy soul is. I will not leave you. And, and, and then they go to Jordan and, and he sees that he will not leave no matter how much he's rejected. Because life has made him hungry for the moment. If you can quit, you were never supposed to have it. He is hungry. And when Elijah sees that he's hungry, he says, what will I do for you? Because you never let people be better to you than you are to them. What will I do for you? He says, I want a double portion of your spirit. Elijah says, you've asked for a hard thing. But if you're in position when I, when I go, you'll get it. 
my team, when I had gotten called to preach at the Potter's House, we literally got called by Bishop Jakes at 7 p.m. at night to come to the Potter's House the next day to preach. It was my biggest moment of my life. It changed my whole world. So many opportunities have come after that. I mean, my life has changed. And they found out and we're all panicking and scrambling. And of course, they're paying to get me out. But everybody on my team said, we're going too. So they all started taking money out of their savings and all over the place. Because when you're serious, the worst thing in the world is to give your life to something and miss the moment that the person is taken to the next level. You never know which day is going to be the day that your world changes. He's in position. My mother's watching. Give me another wave, mom, in the chat rooms. My mom knows if I have to choose between my purpose and her, my mother will always lose. Am I right, mom? My siblings will always lose. My job when I worked a full-time job early in the ministry would always lose because I've given my life to this. And you think I'm going to serve 50-some Sundays, be at church all the time, and then risk missing? This is why I have to do online only for two weeks in the summer. Because if I don't do online only and shut the building down, the people around me will not take their families on vacation. They will not miss when I'm here. Because they've given their life to this, not their money. Not, not their Sundays. They have given their life to this. Because whatever is on my life, they don't want to miss the moment that it gets dropped. So I have to shut it down and do online only or they won't take their kids on vacations. Because when you get serious about your calling, it becomes the only thing that matters because in eternity, Paul don't want to hear about your family. Abraham don't want to hear about your savings. These people were murdered for their faith. These people gave up everything, Peter said, to follow Jesus. My question is, if you had to sit around a table with the greats for eternity, would you run out of things to say in the first 10 minutes? Because that's what living for earth does. You don't build up a resume or conversation for heaven. Oh, it's heavy. So he's following him. He says, if you want this hard thing, how many have a hard thing you want from God? He says, God is not intimidated by your hard thing. There is no hard thing that intimidates God. I don't care what it, you can ask God for whatever amount of money you need. It doesn't make God tremble. You can ask God for healing to stage four cancer. It doesn't make God start freaking out. You can ask God to get your kid to college for free. And it doesn't make God run around the kitchen table with his hands in the air. You can ask God to fix your marriage. You can ask God to get you a marriage. You can ask God to bless your business. There is no hard thing that makes God panic but God says I will not give it to you because you ask I'll give it to you because when I look you're there and for someone the greatest move or decision you can make is to just be in position to just be in position Look at the process he took him through. And this is the process we all must go through. He took him to Gilgal. What is Gilgal in the Bible? It's the place of circumcision. It's the place where Joshua circumcised all the men for the promised land. Gilgal is the place where you allow somebody to start cutting on you. Where you stop resisting and you stop fighting. And like Isaac, you lay on an altar and say, keep cutting till all the flesh is gone. 
That's Gilgal. That's Gilgal. Then he took him to Bethel. Because if you're really serious about getting rid of the flesh, you will be really serious about Bethel. And what is Bethel? Bethel is the house of the Lord. You always know a person is ready to battle their flesh by their dedication to the house. And then once he got him in the house, he took him to Jericho. What is Jericho? Jericho is the place where the shouting takes place. Because shouting don't take shouting doesn't make sense when you're still at Gilgal. But once you survive Gilgal and you look back at all that God took and you're still standing and all the devil hit you with and you're still standing, I've got something to shout about. I've got something to scream about. But here's the catch too. Shouting to bring down walls of Jericho, that's stupid. God's ways will always be stupid to a person that does not go through Gilgal and Bethel. But Jericho is not just a place of church shouting. Jericho is a place of dedication, devotion. It means devoted thing. It's the one of ten cities that God told Joshua, you don't touch, you don't take the gold, the silver, the clothing, the food, you leave it. It is my city. It is one of ten cities. It is the biggest city, but you, you don't take it. As you get through Gilgal and get dedicated to house, at some point, it was one of 10 cities, it was devoted. At some point, you have to transition to living a life of tithing. You cannot get to the next step and not tithe. To every person that does not tithe, you are stuck at Jericho. And the best thing you will ever be able to get is a shout from God. You'll see some walls fall, but you'll never see transformation happen the way it happens at the Jordan where this becomes that where everything is different he's gradually taking him and once they get the tithe down and they're heading to the Jordan he says what do you want what do you want I want a double portion of your spirit Elijah would do 16 miracles in his life. Elijah would do 32 on the button. His last miracle was legacy. It happened when he died. They put a dead man in a tomb with his bones and he came alive. That was miracle number 32. Legacy. It means even when I die, stuff's going to come alive because of what I dedicated my life to. He says, if you're in position, it will be given to you. All these times of being rejected, go away, go away, go away. All of these different stops, Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, Jordan. He wrote it out because the oxen prepared them for a moment. While the students were staring afar off as they walked, the oxen prepared them for a moment. And it says that he is walking by the boy in the field. And he doesn't go up and introduce himself. He just takes his mantle, his jacket, drops it and keeps walking. Now, Elisha could have kept working, but there was something in him that realized this is a moment. And if I let this moment pass me by, because it says Elijah just passed by him. Remember when Jesus was on the water with the disciples, it says, and he would have passed by them. But they started screaming and he stopped. This is how fast your moment will happen. The moment is just passing by. He has all the stuff. He has all the work ethic. All he needs is an opportunity. Yeah. 
and the opportunity just walks by. And at this moment, he had to make a decision. Do I stay in what's now or do I chase after tomorrow? Do I stay the big guy in this field? Because I'm in control out here. These oxen listen to me out here. Ain't nobody telling me what to do out here. Do I stay the big guy in the field? Or for a season, do I become the little guy with the man? It's a decision. It's a decision. I can control this, but I can't control that. Those oxen would never disrespect me. He's going to disrespect me sometimes. Those oxen would never correct me, but he's going to correct me sometimes. But those oxen demand, demand consistency. He's going to demand my consistency. Everything's going to change if I do this. But there was something in him. And you see it happen once in a while. Remember Paul, he says, those things you have seen and heard and witnessed to me, do and the God of peace will be with you. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, to every person that refuses to follow Paul says, do those things you have seen me do, and the peace of God will be with you. To every person that refuses to follow, you refuse to have peace in your life. It is a moment. The disciples had it with Jesus when they left their fishing companies, left their tax firms, left being doctors. It was a moment that they realized, I have to jump on this. It was a moment that Ruth had with Naomi. It was a moment that Joshua had with Moses. It was a moment that Timothy had with Paul. It was just a moment that passed by. And he ran after it. Because when you realize that God loves you so much that he is giving you a moment. My spiritual father told me this before. You know how much God loves you by the type of rooms he puts you in. He always puts people in your life that can take you into a room. There's not one person in here that at some point in your life has not had somebody that could take you higher. The problem is we get so focused on our tasks that we miss our moments. He runs. Because for you, this is not a walking season. This is going to be a running season for you. It is going to be a moment that you have to drop everything. And risk stepping into the unknown. And the conflict here becomes, if I follow you, how are mom and dad going to eat? They don't have another son to work the oxen. If I follow you, who's going to get up and take care of this field? If I follow you, my family is going to talk about me. If I follow you, when I go in and tell mom and dad I'm leaving the family business to follow this strange old man. Put yourself there. What would you say to your child if they were running a business and said, I'm giving it all up to follow a preacher? He is going to have to risk failing their expectations of his life. But it's something he feels. Are you sensitive enough to feel the moment that God is going to let pass by you? He runs after him. And the old man says, what have I done to you? Because the old man didn't think that he was going to run. He thought he did his job. He didn't know the little boy was going to want to do life with him and follow him around. But the old man didn't understand 
that if I follow you, everything I learned from my life now, I only have one skill set, Elijah. So everything I did for my family, you've now got. But first, but first, let me go kiss my mom and dad goodbye. Now, Jesus said, nobody that puts their hand to the plow and looks back is, is fit for the kingdom of God. And remember when the one guy said, let me go back and bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. And one said, let me go back and tell my mother and father goodbye. Pick up your cross and follow but what's the difference between this moment and what Jesus preached against? This will be the last time scripturally that he ever kisses his mother and father. He is literally telling them, but who's going to get up and feed the oxen? But who's going to get up and work the field? Elijah, if you don't do this, we don't know what our future looks like. And I had to tell somebody this one time. I said, your responsibility, yes, it is to be good, but your responsibility is to never choose people over your purpose. Wherever people end up, it is because they are reaping what they sowed to their life. And the worst thing a parent can do is make their children feel guilty for their reaping season because of what they didn't do. How are we going to eat? How are we going to work? I'm too old to work the field, boy. I don't know, Dad. But I do know this. God wouldn't have given me this moment if he didn't want me to chase after it. So I love you guys. And thank you for my life. And thank you for taking care of me. And thank you for putting principles in me that even though you're hurting now, thousands of years later, people are going to be in a church talking about our family. They wouldn't even know who we were. We would just be a, another family since the creation of the earth. No, they're going to know our dad. Dad, they're going to know your name because of me. Your name is going to be in the Bible because you're just as responsible as I am for putting the work ethics in me that would, would keep the kingdom moving forward. But I have to chase the one that has the keys to my future. And he wouldn't just kiss his mom and dad goodbye. You know what he did? He boiled the flesh of the oxen and slew them. Why are you killing the oxen? Whew. It's because in this season of my life, I don't want nothing that I can go back to. I don't want a plan B when life don't work. So I'm leaving all the familiar and I'm burning my yesterday so that from this point forward, when the devil tempts me to go back, I'm moving forward. When my feelings are hurt, I've got to move forward. When I don't understand life, i got to move forward. When I'm not happy, i got to move forward. When I'm sick, i got to move forward. When I have an itch, i got to move forward. Forward. I'm killing my yesterday so that God has no competition when it comes to my tomorrow. Who is God telling today? It is time to boil some stuff. It's time to boil a relationship. It's time to boil a job. It's time to boil some friends. It's time to boil some habits because as long as you have something to go back to, you're going to keep turning on God when things don't make sense. Says, it says that Elijah burned and boiled his yesterday. What is tied to your yesterday that you keep going back to that God is saying today it needs to sit 
in the water and boil. He is making a sacrifice. Because that's what this is. He fed everybody with it. He is making a sacrifice for his future. What is the sacrifice you have made for your future? And he left them. And he rose. And he went after Elijah and ministered to him. And for the next six years, every morning he would get up before him. And for the next six years, he would get a reputation, which we'll see in a few weeks. He would get a, rep a reputation for being the guy that watered the hands of Elijah. For the next six years, he would be rejected multiple times by this guy. For the next six years, it would be tough. But you know what's crazy? The more he rejected Elijah, the more Elijah fell in love with him. Because when the time came for him to be taken up, he prayed for a double portion, but he cried, my father, my father. Because when he left his natural father, God loved him so much, he gave him a spiritual father. That did not teach him how to work a field for food. But taught him how to work the field of the earth. And all of this would not have happened. If God didn't find him digging. Way back when. When he was searching. God is searching who is digging because if God can find a digger you know it says that when Elijah was taken up suddenly because that's how it happens it happens suddenly it happens 7 o'clock at night and within 24 hours your life is going to be changed it happens suddenly but people see the suddenly but they don't see the journey. When Elijah's mantle dropped, when the coat dropped, and he picked it up, he would look to heaven and say, where's the God of Elijah? And what he was really saying is, does this work? Is this real? What's the catch? And he struck it. And it worked. God says, if I can get you focused... In this season, what didn't work yesterday is going to work for you now. There will be no catch in this season of your life. Because when God sees that he can trust you, he is going to give you something to strike. And it is going to work. I started my journey with life and building a ministry at 25 and 19. I got saved. I was 22 or so when I heard my spiritual father speak at Jericho City. I had no money. I had no big church I preached for. I was always a part of small storefront churches. I had no connections, no nothing. I just heard his voice and said, well... Every time he speaks that I'm not speaking or obligated in my church, I'm going. And I did it for 10 years. 
taking Chinatown buses all up and down the East Coast, getting picked up at Dundalk Terminal, getting there early in line so I could get a good seat. Some know what that's like. I couldn't afford Greyhound. Definitely couldn't do Amtrak. But I would do this. I'd save up money and fly spirit flights with no baggage all over the country to hear him speak. And there was a moment that I won't share all the details, but I was so discouraged and I said, this, this, this ain't working. And I went home that night frustrated. It was a Thursday or it was a Friday night after a service. I went home frustrated. And the Lord took me to the story of David getting anointed in front of his father and his brothers. And it would be this moment that I did not expect, I did not see happening. It would be this moment that would change my life. It would be this moment that would allow me to meet presidents. It would be this moment that would have me sitting in rooms with all living civil rights leaders. It would have, be this moment that would have me talking with presidents and kings in Africa. It would be this moment that I would start getting molded and reject it in a lot of ways and correct it in a lot of ways. But it was at a moment where I was saying with digging, is it worth it? And I sat through a service and at the end of the service, this was the moment that my whole life changed. The moment a mantle was dropped. Check it out real quick. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. You're still hungry. You're still hungry. In spite of everything you've been through. In spite of the people who disappointed you. In spite of the way you've disappointed God. You're still hungry, and you're ready to walk into it. And come here, walk right into it. Come on, come on. Come on. This is where it's been for you. Every time you get close to it, it moves away. And you pursue it. But every time you step toward it, it backs up. 2017, you overtake it. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I add to your faith virtue. <laughs> your faith virtue. It will require you being fully invested. Fully invested, no more routine, no more getting by, no more procrastination, no more throwing a little bit at a big thing you're gonna have to throw. Ah, ah, oh, everything, 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 everything. Everything that's been holding you back is going to break today. I want you to open your mouth and holler like you just got a break to just down out of your belly.
you know, the reason I wanted to play it is because everybody that you saw on the front row in that church thought they deserved the moment. I wasn't sitting in the front. I don't even know how he saw me. But it was God. And I was at my lowest point, And God saw me. I had no opportunities. I had no connections. But I had God. And God saw me in those communities feeding people. And God saw me in my Bible crying on the pages to find him. And God saw me digging and getting his word in me. God saw me living right. God saw me not being sloppy. That's why anybody that knows me will tell you, I don't care what people say about me. The people around me know me the best. I live my best with integrity, with character. Because from 19 to now, I always cared. And I always care about what does God think about me? I'm the most boring person you're going to meet when you're not. I'm reading my Bible. I'm at Starbucks's all over the place. Because I still want God to see that I have my shovel out. Amen. And as long as I live, I'm going to keep digging. So the question is today, to every person that's tired, to every person that's wondering if God sees you, what I want to know is do you have the instinct to realize that God gave me this message because it's your moment. There are people who missed it. There are people not watching online today. It's your moment. But only you can sense it. And like was said to me, you're going to have to throw everything into it. Because this right here is not a catch. This is real. And the thing about it is, is it was not a catch. But the young man had something that he could catch. And God wants you to catch something. But you need to realize that this is a moment today. That is just going to pass by.